Chapter Ten of the Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: A Coin from Acheron. Not all his guides entered the chamber. When the door closed, Conan saw only one man standing before him, a slim figure, masked in a black cloak with a hood. This the man threw back disclosing a pale oval of a face with calm delicately chiseled features the king set albiona on her feet but she still clung to him and stared apprehensively about her the chamber was a large one with marble walls partly covered with black velvet hangings and thick rich carpets on the mosaic floor laved in the soft golden glow of bronze lamps conan instinctively laid a hand on his hilt there was blood on his hand blood clotted about the mouth of his scabbard for he had sheathed his blade without cleaning it where are we he demanded the stranger answered with a low profound bow in which the suspicious king could detect no trace of irony in the temple of asura your majesty albiona cried out faintly and clung closer to conan staring fitfully at the black arched doors as if expecting the entry of some grisly shape of darkness fear not my lady said their guide there is nothing here to harm you vulgar superstition to the contrary if your monarch was sufficiently convinced of the innocence of our religion to protect us from the persecution of the ignorant then certainly one of his subjects need have no apprehensions who are you demanded conan i am hadrathus priest of asura one of my followers recognized you when you entered the city and brought the word to me conan grunted profanely do not fear that others discovered your identity hadrathus assured him your disguise would have deceived any but a follower of asura whose cult is to seek below the aspect of illusion you were followed to the watchtower and some of my people went into the tunnel to aid you if you returned by that route others myself among them surrounded the tower and now king conan it is yours to command here in the temple of asura you are still king why should you risk your lives for me asked the king you were our friend when you sat upon your throne answered hadrathus you protected us when the priests of mithra sought to scourge us out of the land conan looked at him curiously he had never before visited the temple of asura had not certainly known that there was such a temple in tarantia the priests of the religion had a habit of hiding their temples in a remarkable fashion the worship of mithra was overwhelmingly predominant in the hyborian nations but the cult of asura persisted in spite of official ban and popular antagonism conan had been told dark tales of hidden temples where intense smoke drifted up incessantly from black altars where kidnapped humans were sacrificed before a great coiled serpent whose fearsome head swayed forever in the haunted shadows persecution caused the followers of asura to hide their temples with cunning art and to veil their rituals in obscurity and this secrecy in turn evoked more monstrous suspicions and tales of evil but conan's was the broad tolerance of the barbarian and he had refused to persecute the followers of asura or to allow the people to do so on no better evidence than was presented against them rumors and accusations that could not be proven if they are black magicians he had said how will they suffer you to harry them if they are not there is no evil in them crumbs devils let men worship what gods they will at a respectful invitation from hydrathus he seated himself on an ivory chair and motioned albiona to another but she preferred to sit on a golden stool at his feet pressing close against his thigh as if seeking security in the contact like most orthodox followers of mithra she had an intuitive horror of the followers and cult of asura instilled in her infancy and childhood 
by wild tales of human sacrifice and anthropomorphic gods shambling through shadowy temples hydrathus stood before them his uncovered head bowed what is your wish your majesty food first he grunted and the priest smote a golden gong with a silver wand scarcely had the mellow tones ceased echoing when four hooded figures came through a curtained doorway bearing a great four-legged silver platter of smoking dishes and crystal vessels this they set before conan bowing low and the king wiped his hands on the damask and smacked his lips with unconcealed relish beware your majesty whispered albiona these folks eat human flesh i'll stake my kingdom that this is nothing but honest roast beef answered conan come lass fall to you must be hungry after the prison fare thus advised and with the example before her of one whose word was the ultimate law to her the countess complied and ate ravenously though daintily while her liege lord tore into the meat joints and guzzled the wine with as much gusto as if he had not already eaten once that night you priests are shrewd hadrathus he said with a great beef bone in his hands and his mouth full of meat i'd welcome your service in my campaign to regain my kingdom slowly hadrathus shook his head and conan slammed the beef bone down on the table in a gust of impatient wrath crimes devils what ails the men of aquilonia first servius now you can you do nothing but wag your idiotic heads when i speak of ousting these dogs hydrathus sighed and answered slowly my lord it is ill to say and i fain would say otherwise but the freedom of aquilonia is at an end nay the freedom of the whole world may be at an end age follows age in the history of the world and now we enter an age of horror and slavery as it was long ago what do you mean demanded the king uneasily hydrathus dropped into a chair and rested his elbows on his thighs staring at the floor it is not alone the rebellious lords of aquilonia and the armies of nemedia which are arrayed against you answered hydrathus it is sorcery grisly black magic from the grim youth of the world an awful shape has risen out of the shades of the past and none can stand before it what do you mean conan repeated i speak of zaltotun of acheron who died three thousand years ago yet walks the earth to-day conan was silent while in his mind floated an image the image of a bearded face of calm inhuman beauty again he was haunted by a sense of uneasy familiarity acheron the sound of the word roused instinctive vibrations of memory and associations in his mind acheron he repeated zaltotun of acheron man are you mad acheron has been a myth for more centuries than i can remember i've often wondered if it ever existed at all it was a black reality answered hydrathus an empire of black magicians steeped in evil now long forgotten it was finally overthrown by the hyborian tribes of the west the wizards of acheron practice foul necromancy thaumaturgy of the most evil kind grisly magic taught them by devils and of all the sorcerers of that accursed kingdom none was so great as zaltotun of python then how was he ever overthrown asked conan skeptically by some means a source of cosmic power which he jealously guarded was stolen and turned against him that source has been returned to him and he is invincible albiona hugging the headman's black cloak about her stared from the priest to the king not understanding the conversation conan shook his head angrily you are making game of me he growled if zaltotun has been dead three thousand years how can this man be he it's some rogue who's taken the old one's name 
Hadrathus leaned to an ivory table and opened a small gold chest which stood there. From it he took something which glinted dully in the mellow light. A broad gold coin of antique minting. You have seen Zaltotun unveiled? Then look upon this. It is a coin which was stamped in ancient Acheron before its fall. So pervaded with sorcery was that black empire that even this coin has its uses in making magic. Conan took it and scowled down at it. There was no mistaking its great antiquity. Conan had handled many coins in the years of his plunderings and had a good practical knowledge of them. The edges were worn and the inscription almost obliterated. But the countenance stamped on one side was still clear-cut and distinct. And Conan's breath sucked in between his clenched teeth. It was not cool in the chamber, but he felt a prickling of his scalp, an icy contraction of his flesh. The countenance was that of a bearded man, inscrutable, with a calm, inhuman beauty. "'By Crom! It's he!' muttered Conan. He understood now the sense of familiarity that the sight of the bearded man had roused in him from the first. He had seen a coin like this once before, long ago, in a far land. With a shake of his shoulders he growled, "'The likeness is only a coincidence. Or if he's shrewd enough to assume a forgotten wizard's name, he's shrewd enough to assume his likeness. But he spoke without conviction. The sight of that coin had shaken the foundations of his universe. He felt that reality and stability were crumbling into an abyss of illusion and sorcery. A wizard was understandable, but this was diabolism beyond sanity. We cannot doubt that it is indeed Zaltotun of Python, said Hadrathus. He it was who shook down the cliffs at Valkia, by his spells that enthralled the elementals of the earth. He it was who sent the creature of darkness into your tent before dawn. Conan scowled at him. How did you know that? The followers of Asura have secret channels of knowledge. That does not matter. But do you realize the futility of sacrificing your subjects in a vain attempt to regain your crown? Conan rested his chin on his fist and stared grimly into nothing. Albiona watched him anxiously, her mind groping bewildered in the mazes of the problems that confronted him. Is there no wizard in the world who could make magic to fight Zaltotun's magic? he asked at last. Hadratha shook his head. If there were, we of Asura would know of him. Men say our cult is a survival of the ancient Stygian serpent worship. That is a lie. Our ancestors come from Vinya, beyond the Sea of Violet and the blue Himalayan mountains. We are sons of the East, not the South, and we have knowledge of all the wizards of the East, who are greater than the wizards of the West and not one of them but would be a straw in the wind before the black might of Zaltotun. But he was conquered once, persisted Conan. Aye, a cosmic source was turned against him. But now that source is again in his hands, and he will see that it is not stolen again. And what is this damnable source? demanded Conan irritably. It is called the Heart of Aramon. When Acheron was overthrown, the primitive priest who had stolen it and turned it against Zaltotun hid it in a haunted cavern and built a small temple over the cavern. Thrice thereafter the temple was rebuilt, each time greater and more elaborately than before, but always on the site of the original shrine, though men forgot the reason therefor. Memory of the hidden symbol faded from the minds of common men, and was preserved only in priestly books and esoteric volumes. Whence it came, no one knows. Some say it is the veritable heart of a god, others that it is a star that fell from the skies long ago. 
until it was stolen none had looked upon it for three thousand years when the magic of the mithron priests failed against the magic of zaltotun's acolyte altaro they remembered the ancient legend of the heart and the high priest and the acolyte went down into the dark and terrible crypt below the temple into which no priest had descended for three thousand years in the ancient iron-bound volumes which speak of the heart in their cryptic symbolism it is also told of a creature of darkness left by the ancient priests to guard it far down in a square chamber with arched doorways leading off into immeasurable blackness the priest and his acolytes found a black stone altar that glowed dimly with inexplicable radiance on that altar lay a curious gold vessel like a double-valved seashell which clung to the stone like a barnacle but it gaped open and empty the heart of ariman was gone while they stared in horror the keeper of the crypt the creature of darkness came upon them and mangled the high priest so that he died but the acolyte fought off the being a mindless soulless waif of the pits brought long ago to guard the heart and escaped up the long black narrow stairs carrying the dying priest who before he died gasped out the news to his followers bade them submit to a power they could not overcome and commanded secrecy but the word had been whispered about among the priests and we of asura learned of it and zaltotun draws his power from this symbol asked conan still skeptical no his power is drawn from the black gulf but the heart of ariman came from some far universe of flaming light and against it the powers of darkness cannot stand when it is in the hands of an adept it is like a sword that might smite at him not a sword with which he can smite it restores life and can destroy life he has stolen it not to use against his enemies but to keep them from using it against him a shell-shaped bowl of gold on a black altar in a deep cavern conan muttered frowning as he sought to capture the elusive image that reminds me of something i have heard or seen but what in crom's name is this notable heart it is in the form of a great jewel like a ruby but pulsing with blinding fire with which no ruby ever burned it glows like living flame but Cronan sprang suddenly up and smote his right fist into his left palm like a thunderclap. Rom! he roared. What a fool I've been! The heart of Araman! The heart of my kingdom! Find the heart of my kingdom, Zelata said. By Ymir, it was the jewel I saw in the green smoke! The jewel which Taraska stole from Zaltotun while he lay in the sleep of the Black Lotus! Hadrathus was also on his feet, his calm dropped from him like a garment. What are you saying? The heart stolen from Zaltotun? Aye, Conan boomed. Taraskus feared Zaltotun and wanted to cripple his power, which he thought resided in the heart. Maybe he thought the wizard would die if the heart was lost. By Grom! Ah! With a savage grimace of disappointment and disgust, he dropped his clenched hand to his side i forgot taraskus gave it to a thief to throw into the sea by this time the fellow must be almost to cordava before i can follow him he'll take ship and consign the heart to the bottom of the ocean the sea will not hold it exclaimed hadrathus quivering with excitement so totun would himself have cast it into the ocean long ago had he not known that the first storm would carry it ashore but on what unknown beach might it not land well conan was recovering some of his resilient confidence there's no assurance that the thief will throw it away if i know thieves and i should for i was a thief in zamora in my early youth he won't throw it away he'll sell it to some rich trader by crom he strode back and forth in his growing excitement. It's worth looking for. 
Zelata bade me find the heart of my kingdom, and all else she showed me proved to be truth. Can it be that the power to conquer Zaltotun lurks in that crimson bauble? Aye, my head upon it, cried Hadrathus, his face lightening with fervor, his eyes blazing, his fists clenched. With it in our hands we can dare the powers of Zaltotun, I swear it. If we can recover it, we have an even chance of recovering your crown and driving the invaders from our portals. It is not the swords of Nemedia that Aquilonia fears, but the black arts of Zaltotun. Conan looked at him for a space, impressed by the priest's fire. It's like a quest in a nightmare, he said at last. Yet your words echo the thought of Zelata, and all else she said was truth. I'll seek for this jewel. It holds the destiny of Aquilonia, said Hadrathus with conviction. I will send men with you. Nay, exclaimed the king impatiently, not caring to be hampered by priests on his quest, however skilled in esoteric arts. This is a task for a fighting man. I go alone. First to Pointaine, where I'll leave Albiona with Tosero, then to Cordava and to the sea beyond if necessary it may be that even if the thief intends carrying out tarascus's order he'll have some difficulty finding an outbound ship at this time of the year and if you find the heart cried hydrathus i will prepare the way for your conquest before you return to aquilonia i will spread the word through secret channels that you live and are returning with a magic stronger than zaltotun's I will have men ready to rise on your return. They will rise if they have assurance that they will be protected from the black arts of Zaltotun. And I will aid you on your journey. He rose and struck a gong. A secret tunnel leads from beneath this temple to a place outside the city wall. You shall go to Pointaine on a pilgrim's boat. None will dare molest you. As you will. With a definite purpose in mind, Conan was afire with impatience and dynamic energy. Only let it be done swiftly. In the meantime, events were moving not slowly elsewhere in the city. A breathless messenger had burst into the palace, where Valerius was amusing himself with his dancing girls, and, throwing himself on his knee, gasped out a garbled story of a bloody prison break and the escape of a lovely captive. He bore also the news that Count Thespius, to whom the execution of Albiona's sentence had been entrusted, was dying and begging for a word with Valerius before he passed. Hurriedly cloaking himself, Valerius accompanied the man through various winding ways and came to a chamber where Thespius lay. There was no doubt that the Count was dying. Bloody froth bubbled from his lips at each shuddering gasp. His severed arm had been bound to stop the flow of blood, but even without that the gash in his side was mortal. Alone in the chamber with the dying man, Valerius swore softly. By Mithra, I had believed that only one man ever lived who could strike such a blow. Valerius, gasped the dying man, he lives. Conan lives. What are you saying? ejaculated the other. I swear by Mithra, gurgled Thespius, gagging on the blood that gushed to his lips. It was he who carried off Albiona. He is not dead. No phantom come back from hell to haunt us. He is flesh and blood, and more terrible than ever. The alley behind the tower is full of dead men beware valerius he has come back to slay us all a strong shudder shook the blood-smeared figure and count thespius went limp valerius frowned down at the dead man cast a swift glance about the empty chamber and stepping swiftly to the door cast it open suddenly the messenger and a group of Nemedian guardsmen stood several paces down the corridor. Valerius muttered something that might have indicated satisfaction. "'Have all the gates been closed?' he demanded. 
Yes, Your Majesty. Triple the guard at each. Let no one enter or leave the city without strictest investigation. Set men scouring the streets and searching the quarters. A very valuable prisoner has escaped with the aid of an Aquilonian rebel. Did any of you recognize the man? No, Your Majesty. The old watchman had a glimpse of him, but could only say that he was a giant, clad in the black garb of the executioner, whose naked body we found in an empty cell. He is a dangerous man, said Valerius. Take no chances with him. You all know the Countess Albiona. Search for her, and if you find her, kill her and her companion instantly. Do not try to take them alive. Returning to his palace chamber, Valerius summoned before him four men of curious and alien aspect. They were tall, gaunt, of yellowish skin, and immobile countenances. They were very similar in appearance, clad alike in long black robes, beneath which their sandaled feet were just visible. Their features were shadowed by their hoods. They stood before Valerius, with their hands in their wide sleeves, their arms folded. Valerius looked at them without pleasure. In his far journeys he had encountered many strange races. "'When I found you starving in the Kithan jungles,' he said abruptly, "'exiles from your kingdom, you swore to serve me. "'You have served me well enough in your abominable way.' one more service i require and then i set you free of your oath conan the cimmerian king of aquilonia still lives in spite of zaltotun's sorcery or perhaps because of it i know not the dark mind of that resurrected devil is too devious and subtle for a mortal man to fathom but while conan lives i am not safe the people accepted me as the lesser of two evils when they thought he was dead let him reappear and the throne will be rocking under my feet in revolution before i can lift my hand perhaps my allies mean to use him to replace me if they decide i have served my purpose i do not know i do know that this planet is too small for two kings of aquilonia seek the cimmerian use your uncanny talents to ferret him out wherever he hides or runs he has many friends in tarantia he had aid when he carried off albiona it took more than one man even such a man as conan to wreck all that slaughter in the alley outside the tower but no more take your staffs and strike his trail where that trail will lead you i know not but find him and when you find him slay him the four kithans bowed together and still unspeaking turned and padded noiselessly from the chamber end of chapter 10「chapter 11 of the hour of the dragon by robert e howard this librivox recording is in the public domain Chapter 11 Swords of the South Dawn that rose over the distant hills shone on the sails of a small craft that dropped down the river which curves to within a mile of the walls of Tarantia and loops southward like a great shining serpent. The boat differed from the ordinary craft plying the broad Cahoratos, fishermen and merchant barges loaded with rich goods. It was long and slender, with a high curving prow, and was black as ebony, with white skulls painted along the gunwales. Amidship rose a small cabin, the windows closely masked. Other craft gave the ominously painted boat a wide berth, for it was obviously one of those pilgrim boats that carry a lifeless follower of Asura on his last mysterious pilgrimage southward to where, far beyond the Pointanian mountains, a river flowed at last into the blue ocean. In that cabin undoubtedly lay the corpse of the departed worshipper. All men were familiar with the sight of those gloomy craft and the most fanatical votary of Mithra would not dare touch or interfere with their somber voyages. Where the ultimate destination lay, men did not know. 
some said stygia some a nameless island lying beyond the horizon others said it was in the glamorous and mysterious land of vinya where the dead came home at last but none knew certainly they only knew that when a follower of asura died the corpse went southward down the great river in a black boat rowed by a giant slave and neither boat nor corpse nor slave was ever seen again unless indeed certain dark tales were true and it was always the same slave who rowed the boats southward the man who propelled this particular boat was as huge and brown as the others though close scrutiny might have revealed the fact that the hue was the result of carefully applied pigments he was clad in leather loincloth and sandals and he handled the long sweep and oars with unusual skill and power but none approached the grim boat closely for it was well known that the followers of asura were accursed and that these pilgrim boats were loaded with dark magic so men swung their boats wide and muttered an incantation as the dark craft slid past and they never dreamed that they were thus assisting in the flight of their king and the countess albiona it was a strange journey in that black slim craft down the great river for nearly two hundred miles to where the cohoritas swings eastward skirting the pointanian mountains like a dream the ever-changing panorama glided past during the day albiona lay patiently in the little cabin as quietly as the corpse she pretended to be only late at night after the pleasure boats with their fair occupants lounging on silken cushions in the flare of torches held by slaves had left the river before dawn brought the hurrying fisher boats did the girl venture out then she held the long sweep cunningly bound in place by ropes to aid her while conan snatched a few hours of sleep but the king needed little rest the fire of his desires drove him relentlessly and his powerful frame was equal to the grinding test without halt or pause they drove southward so down the river they fled through nights when the flowing current mirrored the million stars and through days of golden sunlight leaving winter behind them as they sped southward they passed cities in the night above which throbbed and pulsed the reflection of the myriad lights lordly river villas and fertile groves so at last the blue mountains of pointaine rose above them tier above tier like ramparts of the gods and the great river swerving from those turreted cliffs swept thunderously through the marching hills with many a rapid and foaming cataract conan scanned the shoreline closely and finally swung the long sweep and headed inshore at a point where a neck of land jutted into the water and fir trees grew in a curiously symmetrical ring about a gray strangely shaped rock how these boats ride those falls we hear roaring ahead of us is more than i can see he grunted hadratha said they did but here's where we halt he said a man would be waiting for us with horses but i don't see anyone how word of our coming could have preceded us i don't know anyway he drove inshore and bound the prow to an arching root in the low bank and then plunging into the water washed the brown paint from his skin and emerged dripping and in his natural color from the cabin he brought forth a suit of aquilonian ring mail which hadrathus had procured for him and his sword these he donned while albiona put on garments suitable for mountain travel and when conan was fully armed and turned to look toward the shore he started and his hand went to his sword for on the shore under the trees stood a black cloaked figure holding the reins of a white palfrey and a bay warhorse who are you demanded the king the other bowed low a follower of asura a command came i obeyed how came inquired conan but the other merely bowed again i have come to guide you through the mountains to the first poitanian stronghold i don't need a guide answered conan i know these hills well 
I thank you for the horses, but the Countess and I will attract less attention alone than if we were accompanied by an acolyte of Asura. The man bowed profoundly, and, giving the reins into Conan's hands, stepped into the boat. Casting off, he floated down the swift current toward the distant roar of the unseen rapids. With a baffled shake of his head, Conan lifted the Countess into the palfrey's saddle, and then mounted the war-horse and reined toward the summits that castellated the sky. The rolling country at the foot of the towering mountains was now a borderland in a state of turmoil, where the barons reverted to feudal practices and bands of outlaws roamed unhindered. Poitain had not formally declared her separation from Aquilonia, but she was now to all intents a self-contained kingdom, ruled by her hereditary count, Trocero. The rolling south country had submitted nominally to Valerius, but he had not attempted to force the passes guarded by strongholds where the crimson leopard banner of Poitain waved defiantly. The king and his fair companion rode up the long blue slopes in the soft evening. As they mounted higher, the rolling country spread out like a vast purple mantle far beneath them, shot with the shine of rivers and lakes, the yellow glint of broad fields, and the white gleam of distant towers. Ahead of them, and far above, they glimpsed the first of the Poitanian holes, a strong fortress dominating a narrow pass, the crimson banner streaming against the clear blue sky. Before they reached it, a band of knights in burnished armor rode from among the trees, and their leader sternly ordered the travelers to halt. They were tall men with dark eyes and raven locks of the south. Halt, sir, and state your business and why you ride toward Poitain. Is Poitain in revolt, then? asked Conan, watching the other closely. That a man in Aquilonian harness is halted and questioned like a foreigner? Many rogues ride out of Aquilonia these days, answered the other coldly. As for revolt, if you mean the repudiation of a usurper, then Poitain is in revolt. We had rather serve the memory of a dead man than the scepter of a living dog. Conan swept off his helmet, and, shaking back his black mane, stared full at the speaker. The Poitanian stared violently and went livid. "'Saints of heaven!' he gasped. "'It's—it it is the king! Alive!' The other stared wildly. Then a roar of wonder and joy burst from them. They swarmed about Conan, shouting their war cries and brandishing their swords in their extreme emotion. The acclaim of Poitanian warriors was a thing to terrify a timid man. "'Oh, but Trocero will weep tears of joy to see you, sire,' cried one. "'Aye, and Prospero,' shouted another. "'The general has been like one wrapped in a mantle of melancholy, "'and curses himself night and day that he did not reach the Valkia in time to die beside his king.' "'Now we strike for Empry,' yelled another, whirling his great sword about his head. "'Hail, Conan, king of Poitain!' The clangor of bright steel about him and the thunder of their acclaim frightened the birds that rose in gay-hued clouds from the surrounding trees. The hot southern blood was afire, and they desired nothing but for their new-found sovereign to lead them to battle and pillage. "'What is your command, sire?' they cried. "'Let one of us ride ahead and bear the news of your coming into Poitain.' Banners will wave from every tower, roses will carpet the road before your horse's feet, and all the beauty and chivalry of the South will give you the honor due you— Conan shook his head. Who could doubt your loyalty? But winds blow over these mountains into countries of my enemies, and I would rather these didn't know that I lived, yet. Take me to Chesero and keep my identity a secret." So what the knights would have made a triumphal procession was more in the nature of a secret flight. They traveled in haste, speaking to no one except for a whisper to the captain on duty at each pass, and Conan rode among them with his visor lowered. 
the mountains were uninhabited save by outlaws and garrisons of soldiers who guarded the passes the pleasure-loving poitanians had no need nor desire to wrest a hard and scanty living from their stern breasts south of the ranges the rich and beautiful plains of poitain stretched to the river alamein but beyond the river lay the land of zingara even now when winter was crisping the leaves beyond the mountains the tall rich grass waved upon the plains where grazed the horses and cattle for which poitain was famed palm trees and orange groves smiled in the sun and the gorgeous purple and gold and crimson towers of castles and cities reflected the golden light it was a land of warmth and plenty of beautiful men and ferocious warriors it is not only the hard lands that breed hard men poitain was surrounded by covetous neighbors and her sons learned hardihood in incessant wars to the north the land was guarded by the mountains but to the south only the alamein separated the plains of poitain from the plains of zingara and not once but a thousand times had that river run red to the east lay argos and beyond that ophir proud kingdoms and avaricious the knights of poitain held their lands by the weight and edge of their swords and little of ease and idleness they knew so conan came presently to the castle of count trocero conan sat on a silken divan in a rich chamber whose filmy curtains the warm breeze billowed trocero paced the floor like a panther a lithe restless man with the waist of a woman and the shoulders of a swordsman who carried his years lightly let us proclaim you king of poitain urged the count let those northern pigs wear the yoke to which they have bent their necks the south is still yours dwell here and rule us amid the flowers and the palms but conan shook his head there is no nobler land on earth than poitain but it cannot stand alone bold as are its sons it did stand alone for generations retorted Trocero, with the quick, jealous pride of his breed. We were not always a part of Aquilonia. I know. But conditions are not as they were then, when all kingdoms were broken into principalities which warred with each other. The days of dukedoms and free cities are past. The days of empires are upon us. Rulers are dreaming imperial dreams, and only in unity is their strength then let us unite zingara with poitain argued trocero half a dozen princes strive against each other and the country is torn asunder by civil wars we will conquer it province by province and add it to your dominions then with the aid of the zingarans we will conquer argos and ophir we will build an empire again conan shook his head let others dream imperial dreams I but wish to hold what is mine. I have no desire to rule an empire welded together by blood and fire. It's one thing to seize a throne with the aid of its subjects and rule them with their consent. It's another to subjugate a foreign realm and rule it by fear. I don't wish to be another Valerius. No, Tresero, I'll rule all Aquilonia and no more, or I'll rule nothing then lead us over the mountains and we will smite the nemedians conan's fierce eyes glowed with appreciation no tracero it would be a vain sacrifice i've told you what i must do to regain my kingdom i must find the heart of aramon but this is madness protested tracero the maunderings of a heretical priest the mumblings of a mad witch-woman you were not in my tent before valkia answered conan grimly involuntarily glancing at his right wrist on which blue marks still glowed faintly you didn't see the cliffs thunder down to crush the flower of my army no tracero i've been convinced saltotunes no mortal man 
and only with the heart of Araman can I stand against him. So I'm riding to Cordava alone. But that is dangerous, protested Tresero. Life is dangerous, rumbled the king. I won't go as king of Aquilonia, or even as a knight of Poitain, but as a wandering mercenary, as I rode in Zingara in the old days. Oh, I have enemies enough south of the Alamein, in the lands and the waters of the south. Many who won't know me as king of Aquilonia will remember me as Conan of the Barakan pirates, or Amra of the Black Corsairs. But I have friends, too, and men who will aid me for their own private reasons. A faintly reminiscent grin touched his lips. Drosero dropped his hands helplessly and glanced at Albiona, who sat on a nearby divan. "'I understand your doubts, my lord,' said she. "'But I, too, saw the coin in the temple of Asura, and look, you, Hadratha said it was dated five hundred years before the fall of Acheron. If Zaltotun, then, is the man pictured on the coin, as his majesty swears he is—' That means he is no common wizard, even in his other life, for the years of his life were numbered by centuries, not as the lives of other men are numbered. Before Trocero could reply, a respectful rap was heard on the door, and a voice called, My lord, we have caught a man skulking about the castle, who says he wishes to speak with your guest. I await your orders. A spy from Aquilonia hissed Tresero, catching at his dagger. But Conan lifted his voice and called, Open the door and let me see him. The door was opened, and a man was framed in it, grasped on either hand by stern-looking men-at-arms. He was a slender man, clad in a dark hooded robe. Are you a follower of Asura? asked Conan. The man nodded, and the stalwart men-at-arms looked shocked, and glanced hesitantly at Trocero. The word came southward, said the man. Beyond the Alamein we cannot aid you, for our sect goes no further southward, but stretches eastward with the Korotas. But this I have learned. The thief who took the heart of Araman from Taraskus never reached Cordava. In the mountains of Poitain he was slain by robbers. The jewel fell into the hands of their chief, who, not knowing its true nature, and being harried after the destruction of his band by Poitanian knights, sold it to the Cothic merchant Zorathus. Ha! Conan was on his feet, galvanized. And what of Zorathus? Four days ago he crossed the Alamein, headed for Argos, with a small band of armed servants. He's a fool to cross Zingara in such times, said Trocero. Ay, times are troublous across the river. But Sarathus is a bold man, and reckless in his way. He is in great haste to reach Messantia, where he hopes to find a buyer for the jewel. Perhaps he hopes to sell it finally in Stygia. Perhaps he guesses at its true nature. At any rate, instead of following the long road that winds across the borders of Poitain, and so at last comes into Argos, far from Messantia. He has struck straight across to eastern Zingara, following the shorter and more direct route. Conan smote the table with his clenched fist, so that the great board quivered. Then, by Crom, fortune has at last thrown the dice for me. A horse, Tresero, and the harness of a free companion. Sarathus has a long start but not too long for me to overtake him if I follow him to the end of the world. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 The Fang of the Dragon at dawn, Conan waded his horse across the shallows of the Alamein and struck the wide caravan trail which ran southeastward, and behind him, on the farther bank, Tresero sat his horse silently at the head of his steel-clad knights, with the crimson leopard of Poitain floating its long folds over him in the morning breeze. Silently they sat. 
those dark-haired men in shining steel until the figure of their king had vanished in the blue of distance that whitened towards sunrise conan rode a great black stallion the gift of tresero he no longer wore the armor of aquilonia his harness proclaimed him a veteran of the free companies who were of all races his headpiece was a plain morion dented and battered the leather and mail mesh of his hauberk were worn and shiny as if by many campaigns and the scarlet cloak flowing carelessly over his mailed shoulders was tattered and stained he looked the part of a hired fighting man who had known all vicissitudes of fortune plunder and wealth one day an empty purse and a close-drawn belt the next and more than looking the part he felt the part the awakening of old memories the resurge of the wild mad glorious days of old before his feet were set on the imperial path when he was a wandering mercenary roistering brawling guzzling adventuring with no thought for the morrow and no desire save sparkling ale red lips and a keen sword to swing on all the battlefields of the world unconsciously he reverted to the old ways a new swagger became evident in his bearing in the way he sat his horse half-forgotten oaths rose naturally to his lips and as he rode he hummed old songs that he had roared in chorus with his reckless companions in many a tavern and on many a dusty road or bloody field it was an unquiet land through which he rode the companies of cavalry which usually patrolled the river alert for raids out of poitain were nowhere in evidence internal strife had left the borders unguarded the long white road stretched bare from horizon to horizon no laden camel trains or rumbling wagons or lowing herds moved along it now only occasional groups of horsemen in leather and steel hawk-faced hard-eyed men who kept together and rode warily these swept conan with their searching gaze but rode on for the solitary rider's harness promised no plunder but only hard strokes villages lay in ashes and deserted the fields and meadows idled only the boldest would ride the roads these days and the native population had been decimated in the civil wars and by raids from across the river in more peaceful times the road was thronged with merchants riding poitain to Mesantia to argos or back but now these found it wiser to follow the road that led east through Pointain and then turned south down across Argos. It was longer, but safer. Only an extremely reckless man would risk his life and goods on this road through Zingara. The southern horizon was fringed with flame by night, and in the day straggling pillars of smoke drifted upward. In the cities and plains to the south, men were dying, thrones were toppling, and castles going up in flames. Conan felt the old tug of the professional fighting man to turn his horse and plunge into the fighting, the pillaging, and the looting as in the days of old. Why should he toil to regain the rule of a people which had already forgotten him? Why chase a will o' the wisp? why pursue a crown that was lost for ever why should he not seek forgetfulness lose himself in the red tides of war and rapine that had engulfed him so often before could he not indeed carve out another kingdom for himself the world was entering an age of iron an age of war and imperialistic ambition some strong man might well rise above the ruins of nations as a supreme conqueror why should it not be himself so his familiar devil whispered in his ear and the phantoms of his lawless and bloody past crowded upon him but he did not turn aside he rode onward following a quest that grew dimmer and dimmer as he advanced until sometimes it seemed that he pursued a dream that never was he pushed the black stallion as hard as he dared but the long white road lay bare before him from horizon to horizon 
It was a long start Zarathus had. But Conan rode steadily on, knowing that he was traveling faster than the burdened merchants could travel. And so he came to the castle of Count Valbroso, perched like a vulture's eyrie on a bare hill overlooking the road. Valbroso rode down with his men-at-arms. A lean, dark man with glittering eyes and a predatory beak of a nose. He wore black plate armor and was followed by thirty spearmen, black-moustached hawks of the border wars, as avaricious and ruthless as himself. Of late the toll of the caravans had been slim, and Valbroso cursed the civil wars that stripped the roads of their fat traffic, even while he blessed them for the free hand they allowed him with his neighbors. He had not hoped much from the solitary rider he had glimpsed from his tower, but all was grist that came to his mill. With a practiced eye he took in Conan's worn mail and dark scarred face, and his conclusions were the same as those of the riders who had passed the Cimmerian on the road. An empty purse and a ready blade. "'Who are you, knave?' he demanded. "'A mercenary riding for Argos,' answered Conan. "'What matter names?' You are riding in the wrong direction for a free companion, grunted Valbroso. Southward the fighting is good, and also the plundering. Join my company. You won't go hungry. The road remains bare of fat merchants to strip, but I mean to take my rogues and fare southward to sell our swords to whichever side seems strongest. Conan did not at once reply, knowing that if he refused outright, he might be instantly attacked by Valbroso's men-at-arms. Before he could make up his mind, the Zingaran spoke again. "'You rogues of the free companies always know tricks to make men talk. I have a prisoner, the last merchant I caught by Mithra, and the only one I've seen for a week. And the knave is stubborn. He has an iron box, the secret of which divides us and I've been unable to persuade him to open it. By Ishtar, I thought I knew all the modes of persuasion there are, but perhaps you, as a veteran free companion, know some that I do not. At any rate, come with me and see what you may do. Valbroso's words instantly decided Conan. That sounded a great deal like Zarathus. Conan did not know the merchant, but any man who was stubborn enough to try to traverse the Zingaran road in times like these would very probably be stubborn enough to defy torture. He fell in beside Valbroso and rode up the straggling road to the top of the hill where the gaunt castle stood. As a man-at-arms he should have ridden behind the Count, but force of habit made him careless and Valbroso paid no heed. Years of life on the border had taught the Count that the frontier is not the royal court. He was aware of the independence of the mercenaries, behind whose swords many a king had trodden the throne path. There was a dry moat, half filled with debris in some places. They clattered across the drawbridge and through the arch of the gate. Behind them the portcullis fell with a sudden clang. They came into a bare courtyard, grown with straggling grass and with a well in the middle. Shacks for the men-at-arms straggled about the bailey wall, and women, slatterly or decked in gaudy finery, looked from the doors. Fighting men, in rusty mail, tossed dice on the flags under the arches. It was more like a bandit's hold than the castle of a nobleman. Valbroso dismounted and motioned Conan to follow him. They went through a doorway and along a vaulted corridor, where they were met by a scarred, hard-looking man in mail descending a stone staircase, evidently the captain of the guard. "'How, Veloso?' quoth Valbroso. "'Has he spoken?' "'He is stubborn,' muttered Veloso, shooting a glance of suspicion at Conan. Valbroso ripped out an oath and stamped furiously up the winding stair followed by Conan and the captain. As they mounted, the groans of a man in mortal agony became audible. 
Valbroso's torture room was high above the court, instead of in a dungeon below. In this chamber, where a gaunt, hairy beast of a man in leather breeks squatted gnawing a beef-bone voraciously, stood the machines of torture. Racks, boots, hooks, and all the implements that the human mind devises to tear flesh, break bones, and rend and rupture veins and ligaments. On a rack a man was stretched naked, and a glance told Conan that he was dying. The unnatural elongation of his limbs and body told of unhinged joints and unnameable ruptures. He was a dark man, with an intelligent, aquiline face and quick dark eyes. They were glazed and bloodshot now, with pain, and the dew of agony glistened on his face. His lips were drawn back from blackened gums. "'There is the box,' viciously Valbroso kicked a small but heavy iron chest that stood on the floor nearby. It was intricately carved, with tiny skulls and writhing dragons curiously intertwined, but Conan saw no catch or hasp that might serve to unlock the lid. The marks of fire, of axe, and sledge and chisel showed on it but as scratches. "'This is the dog's treasure-box,' said Valbroso angrily. "'All men of the South know of Zorathus and his iron chest. "'Mithra knows what's in it, but he will not give up its secret. "'Zorathus! It was true, then. "'The man he sought lay before him. "'Conan's heart beat suffocatingly as he leaned over the writhing form, "'though he exhibited no evidence of his painful eagerness. "'Ease those ropes, knave,' he ordered the torturer harshly and Valbroso and his captain stared. In the forgetfulness of the moment, Conan had used his imperial tone, and the brute in leather instinctively obeyed the knife-edge of command in that voice. He eased away gradually, for else the slackening of the ropes had been as great a torment to the torn joints as further stretching. Catching up a vessel of wine that stood nearby, Conan placed the rim to the wretch's lips. Zorathus gulped spasmodically, the liquid slopping over on his heaving breast. Into the bloodshot eyes came a gleam of recognition, and the froth-smeared lips parted. From them issued a racking whimper in the Cothic tongue. "'Is this death, then? Is the long agony ended? For this is King Conan, who died at Valkia.' And I am among the dead. You are not dead, said Conan, but you're dying. You'll be tortured no more, I'll see to that. But I can't help you further. Yet before you die, tell me how to open your iron box. My iron box, mumbled Zorathus in delirious, disjointed phrases. The chest forged in unholy fires among the flaming mountains of Grosha. The metal no chisel can cut. How many treasures has it borne across the width and the breadth of the world? But no such treasure as it now holds. Tell me how to open it, urged Conan. It can do you no good and it may aid me. Ay, you are Conan, muttered the Cothian. I have seen you sitting on your throne in the great public hall of Tarantia, with your crown on your head and the scepter in your hand. But you are dead, you died at Valkia, and so I know my own end is at hand. What does the dog say? demanded Valbroso impatiently, not understanding Cothic. Will he tell us how to open the box? As if the voice roused a spark of life in the twisted breast, Zorathus rolled his bloodshot eyes toward the speaker. Only Valbroso. Broso will I tell, he gasped in Zingaran. 
death is upon me lean close to me valbroso the count did so his dark face lit with avarice behind him his saturnine captain belloso crowded closer press the seven skulls on the rim one after another gasped zarathus press the head of the dragon that writhes across the lid then press the sphere in the dragon's claws <sighs> that will release the secret catch quick the box cried valbroso with an oath conan lifted it and set it on the dais and valbroso shouldered him aside let me open it cried belloso starting forward valbroso cursed him back his greed blazing in his black eyes none but me shall open it he cried conan whose hand had instinctively gone to his hilt glanced at Zarathus. The man's eyes were glazed and bloodshot, but they were fixed on Valbroso with burning intensity. And was there the shadow of a grim, twisted smile on the dying man's lips? Not until the merchant knew he was dying had he given up the secret. Conan turned to watch Valbroso, even as the dying man watched him. Along the rim of the lid, seven skulls were carved among intertwining branches of strange trees an inlaid dragon writhed its way across the top of the lid amid ornate arabesques valbroso pressed the skulls in fumbling haste and as he jammed his thumb down on the carved head of the dragon he swore sharply and snatched his hand away shaking it in irritation a sharp point in the carvings he snarled i've pricked my thumb he pressed the gold ball clutched in the dragon's talons, and the lid flew abruptly open. Their eyes were dazzled by a golden flame. It seemed to their dazed minds that the carved box was full of glowing fire that spilled over the rim and dripped through the air in quivering flakes. Beloso cried out, and Valbroso sucked in his breath. Conan stood speechless his brain snared by the blaze. Mithra, what a jewel! Valbroso's hand dived into the chest, came out with a great pulsing crimson sphere that filled the room with a lambent glow. In its glare, Valbroso looked like a corpse, and the dying man on the loosened rack laughed wildly and suddenly. <laughs> Fool! he screamed. The jewel is yours i give you death with it the scratch on your thumb look at the dragon's head valbroso they all wheeled stared something tiny and dully gleaming stood up from the gaping carved mouth the dragon's fang shrieked zarathus steep in the venom of the black stygian scorpion fool fool to open the box of zarathus with your naked hand death you are a dead man now and with bloody foam on his lips he died valbroso staggered crying out ah mithra i burn he shrieked my veins race with liquid fire my joints are bursting asunder death ah, ah, death and he reeled and crashed headlong there was an instant of awful convulsions in which the limbs were twisted into hideous and unnatural positions and then in that posture the man froze his glassy eyes staring sightlessly upward his lips drawn back from blackened gums dead muttered conan stooping to pick up the jewel where it rolled on the floor from valbroso's rigid hand it lay on the floor like a quivering pool of sunset fire dead muttered veloso with madness in his eyes and then he moved conan was caught off guard his eyes dazzled his brain dazed by the blaze of the great gem 
he did not realize Beloso's intention until something crashed with terrible force upon his helmet. The glow of the jewel was splashed with redder flame, and he went to his knees under the blow. He heard a rush of feet, a bellow of ox-like agony. He was stunned, but not wholly senseless, and realized that Beloso had caught up the iron box and crashed it down on his head as he stooped. Only his bassinet had saved his skull. He staggered up, drawing his sword, trying to shake the dimness out of his eyes. The room swam to his dizzy gaze, but the door was open and fleet footsteps were dwindling down the winding stair. On the floor, the brutish torturer was gasping out his life with a great gash under his breast, and the heart of Ariman was gone. Conan reeled out of the chamber, sword in hand, blood streaming down his face from under his burgonet. He ran drunkenly down the steps, hearing a clang of steel in the courtyard below, shouts, then the frantic drum of hoofs. Rushing into the bailey, he saw the men-at-arms milling about confusedly, while women screeched. The postern gate stood open, and a soldier lay across his pike with his head split. Horses, still bridled and saddled, ran neighing about the court, Conan's black stallion among them. "'He's mad!' howled a woman, wringing her hands as she rushed brainlessly about. "'He came out of the castle like a mad dog, hewing right and left. Beloso's mad! Where's Lord Valbroso?' "'Which way did he go?' roared Conan." All turned and stared at the stranger's blood-stained face and naked sword. "'Through the postern!' shrilled a woman, pointing eastward, and another bawled, "'Who is this rogue?' "'Beloso has killed Valbroso!' yelled Conan, leaping and seizing the stallion's mane, as the men-at-arms advanced uncertainly on him. A wild outcry burst forth at his news, but their reaction was exactly as he had anticipated. Instead of closing the gates to take him prisoner, or pursuing the fleeing slayer to avenge their lord, they were thrown into even greater confusion by his words. Wolves, bound together only by fear of Valbroso, they owed no allegiance to the castle or to each other. Swords began to clash in the courtyard, and women screamed. And in the midst of it all, None noticed Conan as he shot through the postern gate and thundered down the hill. The wide plain spread before him, and beyond the hill the caravan road divided. One branch ran south, the other east. And on the eastern road he saw another rider bending low and spurring hard. The plain swam to Conan's gaze. The sunlight was a thick red haze, and he reeled in his saddle, grasping the flowing mane with his hand. Blood rained on his mail, but grimly he urged the stallion on. Behind him smoke began to pour out of the castle on the hill, where the Count's body lay forgotten and unheeded beside that of his prisoner. The sun was setting. Against a lurid red sky the two black figures fled. The stallion was not fresh, but neither was the horse ridden by Beloso. But the great beast responded mightily, calling on deep reservoirs of reserved vitality. Why the Zingaran fled from one pursuer, Conan did not tax his bruised brain to guess. Perhaps unreasoning panic rode Beloso, born of the madness that lurked in that blazing jewel. The sun was gone. The white road was a dim glimmer through a ghostly twilight, fading into purple gloom far ahead of him. The stallion panted, laboring hard. The country was changing in the gathering dusk. Bare plains gave way to clumps of oaks and alders. Low hills mounted up in the distance. Stars began to blink out. The stallion gasped and reeled in his course, but ahead rose a dense wood that stretched to the hills on the horizon, and between it and himself Conan glimpsed the dim form of the fugitive. 
he urged on the distressed stallion for he saw that he was overtaking his prey yard by yard above the pound of the hoofs a strange cry rose from the shadows but neither pursuer nor pursued gave heed as they swept in under the branches that overhung the road they were almost side by side a fierce cry rose from conan's lips as his sword went up a pale oval of a face was turned toward him a sword gleamed in a half-seen hand and Beloso echoed the cry and then the weary stallion with a lurch and a groan missed his footing in the shadows and went heels overhead hurling his dazed rider from the saddle conan's throbbing head crashed against a stone and the stars were blotted out in a thicker night how long conan lay senseless he never knew his first sensation of returning consciousness was that of being dragged by one arm over rough and stony ground and through dense underbrush then he was thrown carelessly down and perhaps the jolt brought back his senses his helmet was gone his head ached abominably he felt a qualm of nausea and blood was clotted thickly among his black locks but with the vitality of a wild thing life and consciousness surged back into him and he became aware of his surroundings a broad red moon was shining through the trees by which he knew that it was long after midnight he had lain senseless for hours long enough to have recovered from that terrible blow beloso had dealt him as well as the fall which had rendered him senseless his brain felt clearer than it had felt during that mad ride after the fugitive he was not lying beside the white road he noticed with a start of surprise as his surroundings began to record themselves on his perceptions the road was nowhere in sight he lay on the grassy earth in a small glade hemmed in by a black wall of tree stems and tangled branches his face and hands were scratched and lacerated as if he had been dragged through brambles shifting his body he looked about him and then he started violently something was squatting over him at first conan doubted his consciousness thought it was but a figment of delirium surely it could not be real that strange motionless gray being that squatted on its haunches and stared down at him with unblinking soulless eyes conan lay and stared half expecting it to vanish like a figure of a dream and then a chill of recollection crept along his spine half-forgotten memories surged back of grisly tales whispered of the shapes that haunted these uninhabited forests at the foot of the hills that mark the zingara argosian border ghouls men call them eaters of human flesh spawn of darkness children of unholy matings of a lost and forgotten race with the demons of the underworld somewhere in these primitive forests were the ruins of an ancient accursed city men whispered and among its tombs slunk gray anthropomorphic shadows conan shuddered strongly he lay staring at the malformed head that rose dimly above him and cautiously he extended a hand toward the sword at his hip with a horrible cry that the man involuntarily echoed the monster was at his throat conan threw up his right arm and the dog-like jaws closed on it driving the male lynx into the hard flesh the misshapen yet manlike hands clutched for his throat but he evaded them with a heave and roll of his whole body at the same time drawing his dagger with his left hand they tumbled over and over on the grass smiting and tearing the muscles coiling under that gray corpse-like skin were stringy and hard as steel wires exceeding the strength of a man but conan's thews were iron too and his mail saved him from the gnashing fangs and ripping claws long enough for him to drive home his dagger again and again and again 
the horrible vitality of the semi-human monstrosity seemed inexhaustible and the king's skin crawled at the feel of that slick clammy flesh he put all his loathing and savage revulsion behind the plunging blade and suddenly the monster heaved up convulsively beneath him as the point found its grisly heart and then lay still conan rose shaken with nausea he stood in the center of the glade uncertainly sword in one hand and dagger in the other he had not lost his instinctive sense of direction as far as the points of the compass were concerned but he did not know in what direction the road lay he had no way of knowing in which direction the ghoul had dragged him conan glared at the silent black moon dappled woods which ringed him and felt cold moisture bead his flesh he was without a horse and lost in these haunted woods and that staring deformed thing at his feet was a mute evidence of the horrors that lurked in the forest he stood almost holding his breath in his painful intensity straining his ears for some crack of twig or rustle of grass when a sound did come he started violently suddenly out on the night air broke the scream of a terrified horse his stallion there were panthers in the wood or ghouls ate beasts as well as men he broke savagely through the brush in the direction of the sound whistling shrilly as he ran his fear drowned in berserk rage if his horse was killed there went his last chance of following beloso and recovering the jewel again the stallion screamed with fear and fury somewhere nearer there was a sound of lashing heels and something that was struck heavily and gave way conan burst out into the wide white road without warning and saw the stallion plunging and rearing in the moonlight his ears laid back his eyes and teeth flashing wickedly he lashed out with his heels at a slinking shadow that ducked and bobbed about him and then about conan other shadows moved gray furtive shadows that closed in on all sides a hideous charnel house scent reeked up in the night air with a curse the king hewed right and left with his broadsword thrust and ripped with his dagger dripping fangs flashed in the moonlight foul paws caught at him but he hacked his way through to the stallion caught the rein leaped into the saddle his sword rose and fell a frosty arc in the moonlight showering blood as it split misshapen heads clove shambling bodies the stallion reared biting and kicking they burst through and thundered down the road on either hand for a short space flitted gray abhorrent shadows then these fell behind and conan topping a wooded crest saw a vast expanse of bare slopes sweeping up and away before him end of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of the Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen A Ghost Out of the Past. Soon after sunrise, Conan crossed the Argosian border. Of Beloso, he had seen no trace. Either the captain had made good his escape while the king lay senseless or had fallen prey to the grim man-eaters of the Zingara forest. But Conan had seen no signs to indicate the latter possibility. The fact that he had lain unmolested for so long seemed to indicate that the monsters had been engrossed in futile pursuit of the captain. And if the man lived, Conan felt certain that he was riding along the road somewhere ahead of him. Unless he had intended going into Argos, he would never have taken the eastern road in the first place. The helmeted guards at the frontier did not question the Cimmerian. A single wandering mercenary required no passport nor safe conduct, especially when his unadorned mail showed him to be in the service of no lord. 
through the low grassy hills where streams murmured and oak groves dappled the sward with lights and shadows he rode following the long road that rose and fell away ahead of him over dales and rises in the blue distance it was an old old road this highway from pointaine to the sea argos was at peace laden oxwains rumbled along the road and men with bare brown brawny arms toiled in orchards and fields that smiled away under the branches of the roadside trees old men on settles before inns under spreading oak branches called greetings to the wayfarer from the men that worked the fields from the garrulous old men in the inns where he slaked his thirst with great leathern jacks of foaming ale from the sharp-eyed silk-clad merchants he met upon the road conan sought for news of belloso stories were conflicting but this much conan learned that a lean wiry zingaran with the dangerous black eyes and moustaches of the western folk was somewhere on the road ahead of him and apparently making for mesantia it was a logical destination all the seaports of argos were cosmopolitan in strong contrast with the inland provinces and mesantia was the most polyglot of all craft of all the maritime nations rode in its harbor and refugees and fugitives from many lands gathered there laws were lax for mesantia thrived on the trade of the sea and her citizens found it profitable to be somewhat blind on their dealings with seamen it was not only legitimate trade that flowed into mesantia smugglers and buccaneers played their part all this conan knew well for had he not in the days of old when he was a barracan pirate sailed by night into the harbor of mesantia to discharge strange cargoes most of the pirates of the Barakan Isles, small islands off the southwestern coast of Zingara, were Argosian sailors, and as long as they confined their attentions to the shipping of other nations, the authorities of Argos were not too strict in their interpretation of sea laws. But Conan had not limited his activities to those of the Barakans. He had also sailed with the Zingaran buccaneers, and even with those wild black corsairs that swept up from the far south to harry the northern coasts, and this put him beyond the pale of any law. If he were recognized in any of the ports of Argos, it would cost him his head. But without hesitation he rode on to Mesantia, halting day or night only to rest the stallion and to snatch a few winks of sleep for himself. He entered the city unquestioned, merging himself with the throngs that poured continually in and out of this great commercial center. No wall surrounded Mesantia. The sea and the ships of the sea guarded the great southern trading city. It was evening when Conan rode leisurely through the streets that marched down to the waterfront. At the ends of these streets he saw the wharves and the masts and sails of ships. He smelled salt water for the first time in years, heard the thrum of cordage and the creak of spars in the breeze that was kicking up whitecaps out beyond the headlands. Again the urge of far wandering tugged at his heart. But he did not go to the wharves. He reined aside and rode up a steep flight of wide, worn stone steps to a broad street where ornate white mansions overlooked the waterfront and the harbor below. Here dwelt the men who had grown rich from the hard-won fat of the sea, a few old sea captains who had found treasure afar, many traders and merchants who never trod the naked decks, nor knew the roar of tempest or sea-fight. Conan turned in his horse at a certain gold-worked gate, and rode into a court where a fountain tinkled and pigeons fluttered from marble coping to marble flagging. A paid and jagged silken jumper, jupon, and hose came forward inquiringly. The merchants of Mesantia dealt with many strange and rough characters, but most of these smacked of the sea. It was strange that a mercenary trooper should so freely ride into the court of a lord of commerce. The merchant Publio dwells here. 
It was more statement than question, and something in the timbre of the voice caused the page to doff his feather chaperone as he bowed and replied, Aye, so he does, my captain. Conan dismounted, and the page called a servitor, who came running to receive the stallion's rein. Your master is within? Conan drew off his gauntlets and slapped the dust of the road from cloak and mail. Aye, my captain. Whom shall I announce? I'll announce myself, grunted Conan. I know the way well enough. Bide you here. And, obeying that peremptory command, the page stood still, staring after Conan as the latter climbed a short flight of marble steps, and wondering what connection his master might have with this giant fighting man who had the aspect of a northern barbarian. Menials at their tasks halted and gaped open-mouthed as Conan crossed a wide, cool balcony overlooking the court and entered a broad corridor through which the sea breeze swept. Halfway down this he heard a quill scratching and turned into a broad room whose many wide casements overlooked the harbor. Publio sat at a carved teakwood desk, writing on rich parchment with a golden quill. He was a short man, with a massive head and quick dark eyes. His blue robe was of the finest watered silk, trimmed with cloth of gold, and from his thick white throat hung a heavy gold chain. As the Cimmerian entered, the merchant looked up with a gesture of annoyance. He froze in the midst of his gesture. His mouth opened. He stared at a ghost out of the past. Unbelief and fear glimmered in his wide eyes. "'Well,' said Conan, "'have you no word of greeting, Publio?' Publio moistened his lips. "'Honan?' he whispered incredulously. "'Mithra! Conan! Amra! Who else?' The Cimmerian unclasped his cloak and threw it with his gauntlets down upon the desk. "'How, men?' he exclaimed irritably. "'Can't you at least offer me a beaker of wine? My throat's caked with the dust of the highway.' "'Aye, wine,' echoed Publio mechanically. Instinctively his hand reached for a gong, then recoiled as from a hot coal, and he shuddered. While Conan watched him with a flicker of grim amusement in his eyes, the merchant rose and hurriedly shut the door, first craning his neck up and down the corridor to be sure that no slave was loitering about. Then, returning, he took a gold vessel of wine from a nearby table and was about to fill a slender goblet when Conan impatiently took the vessel from him and, lifting it with both hands, drank deep and with gusto. "'Ah, it's Conan right enough,' muttered Publio. "'Man, are you mad?' "'By Chrome, Publio,' said Conan, lowering the vessel but retaining it in his hands. "'You dwell in different quarters than of old. "'It takes an Argosian merchant to wring wealth out of a little waterfront shop "'that stank of rotten fish and cheap wine.' "'The old days are past,' muttered Publio, "'drawing his robe about him with a slight involuntary shudder. "'I have put off the past like a worn-out cloak.' "'Well,' retorted Conan. You can't put me off like an old cloak. It isn't much I want of you, but that much I do want, and you can't refuse me. We had too many dealings in the old days. Am I such a fool that I'm not aware that this fine mansion was built on my sweat and blood? How many cargoes from my galleys passed through your shop? "'All merchants of Missantia have dealt with the sea-rovers at one time or another,' mumbled Publio nervously. "'But not with the black corsairs,' answered Conan grimly. "'For Mithra's sake be silent!' ejaculated Publio, sweat starting out on his brow. His finger jerked at the gilt-worked edge of his robe. "'Well, I only wish to recall it to your mind,' answered Conan. "'Don't be so fearful.' You took plenty of risks in the past, when you were struggling for life and wealth in that lousy little shop down by the wharves, and were hand in glove with every buccaneer and smuggler and pirate from here to the Barakan Isles. Prosperity must have softened you. 
I am respectable, began Publio. <laughs> Meaning you're rich as hell, snorted Conan. Why? Why did you grow wealthy so much quicker than your competitors? Was it because you did a big business in ivory and ostrich feathers, copper and skins and pearls and hammered gold ornaments, and other things from the coast of Kush? And where did you get them so cheaply, while other merchants were paying their weight in silver to the Stygians for them? I'll tell you, in case you've forgotten, you bought them from me, at considerably less than their value, and I took them from the tribes of the Black Coast, and from the ships of the Stygians, I and the Black Corsairs. In Mithra's name cease, begged Publio. I have not forgotten. But what are you doing here? I am the only man in Argos who knew that the king of Aquilonia was once Conan the Buccaneer in the old days. But word has come southward of the overthrow of Aquilonia and the death of the king. My enemies have killed me a hundred times by rumors, grunted Conan. Yet here I sit and guzzle wine of Kairos, and he suited the action to the word. Lowering the vessel, which was now nearly empty, he said, It is but a small thing I ask of you, Publio. I know that you are aware of everything that goes on in Mesantia. I want to know if a Zingaran named Beloso, or he might call himself anything, is in this city. He's tall and lean and dark like all his race, and it's likely he'll seek to sell a very rare jewel. Publio shook his head. I have not heard of such a man, but thousands come and go in Messantia. If he is here, my agents will discover him. Good. Send them to look for him, and in the meantime have my horse cared for, and have food served me here in this room. Publio assented volubly, and Conan emptied the wine vessel, tossed it carelessly into a corner, and strode to a nearby casement involuntarily expanding his chest as he breathed deep of the salt air. He was looking down upon the meandering waterfront streets. He swept the ships in the harbor with an appreciative glance, then lifted his head and stared beyond the bay, far into the blue haze of the distance where sea met sky, and his memory sped beyond that horizon to the golden seas of the south under flaming suns, where laws were not and life ran hotly. Some vagrant scent of spice or palm woke clear-etched images of strange coasts, where mangroves grew and drums thundered, of ships locked in battle and decks running blood, of smoke and flame and the crying of slaughter. Lost in his thoughts, he scarcely noticed when Publio stole from the chamber. Gathering up his robe, the merchant hurried along the corridors until he came to a certain chamber where a tall, gaunt man with a scar upon his temple wrote continually upon parchment. There was something about this man which made his clerkly occupation seem incongruous. To him, Publio spoke abruptly. Conan has returned. Conan? The gaunt man started up and the quill fell from his fingers. The Corsair? I. The gaunt man went livid. Is he mad? If he is discovered here, we are ruined. They will hang a man who shelters or trades with the Corsair as quickly as they'll hang the Corsair himself. What if the governor should learn of our past connections with him? He will not learn, answered Publio grimly. Send your men into the markets and wharfside dives, and learn if one Peloso, a Zingaran, is in Mesantia. Conan said he had a gem which he will probably seek to dispose of. The jewel merchants should know of him, if any do. And here is another task for you. Pick up a dozen or so desperate villains who can be trusted to do away with a man and hold their tongues afterward. You understand me? I understand. The other nodded slowly and somberly. I have not stolen, cheated, lied, and fought my way up from the gutter to be undone now by a ghost out of my past, muttered Pulio, 
and the sinister darkness of his countenance at that moment would have surprised the wealthy nobles and ladies who bought their silks and pearls from his many stalls but when he returned to conan a short time later bearing in his own hands a platter of fruit and meats he presented a placid face to his unwelcome guest conan still stood at the casement staring down into the harbor at the purple and crimson and vermilion and scarlet sails of galleons and carracks and galleys and dromans there's a stygian galley if i'm not blind he remarked pointing to a long low slim black ship lying apart from the others anchored off the low broad sandy beach that curved round to the distant headland is there peace then between stygia and argos the same sort that has existed before answered publio setting the platter on the table with a sigh of relief for it was heavily laden he knew his guest of old stygian ports are temporarily open to our ships as ours to theirs but may no craft of mine meet their cursed galleys out of sight of land that galley crept into the bay last night what its masters wish i do not know so far they have neither bought nor sold i distrust those dark-skinned devils treachery had its birth in that dusky land i'll make them howl said conan carelessly turning from the window in my galley manned by black corsairs i crept to the very bastions of the sea-washed castles of black walled kehemi by night and burned the galleons anchored there and speaking of treachery mine host suppose you taste these viands and sip a bit of this wine just to show me that your heart is on the right side publio complied so readily that conan's suspicions were lulled and without further hesitation he sat down and devoured enough for three men and while he ate men moved through the markets and along the waterfront searching for a zingaran who had a jewel to sell or who sought for a ship to carry him to foreign ports and a tall gaunt man with a scar on his temple sat with his elbows on a wine-stained table in a squalid cellar with a brass lantern hanging from a smoke-blackened beam overhead and held converse with ten desperate rogues whose sinister countenances and ragged garments proclaimed their profession and as the first stars blinked out they shone on a strange band spurring their mounts along the white road that led to Mysantia from the west they were four men tall gaunt clad in black hooded robes and they did not speak they forced their steeds mercilessly onward and those steeds were gaunt as themselves and sweat-stained and weary as if from long travel and far wandering end of chapter 13